Welcome to Unpack It, the inappropriate and unruly series where former cult members read the books of their former cult. We are Nancy and Patty of the Apostate Sisters, and joining us is Mr. Difficult, TikTok creator extraordinaire in the realm of the Worldwide Church of God and its offshoots. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Joel. Hi, hi, hi. <laughs> so the title of the book is The Mything dimension in sex written by one herbert w armstrong the founder and pastor general of worldwide church of god yes he wrote a sex book and i'm very excited to read through it here because uh, it goes in great detail about all things pertaining to sex and we all like sex i mean what so herbert w armstrong did write this book there's a few different versions of it the latest one I want to say came out in 1980 or 1981. I'm going to go ahead and read through this um, sort of forward section that was written by one um, <clears throat> Gerald Flurry, pastor general of Philadelphia Church of God. Philadelphia Church of God was one of the splinter churches, which a lot of the splinter churches did kind of make changes and redistribute some of Herbert W. Armstrong's literature. So here we go. In January 1997, we decided to reprint and distribute Herbert W. Armstrong's final book, Mystery of the Ages. It is the last one he wrote. <laughs> um, and we will get to that book uh, as well. But we're eccentric. We thought we would start with his sex book because that would be more fun. Weeks later, the Worldwide Church of God filed a lawsuit to stop us. Mr. Armstrong oh. founded the Worldwide Church, but after he died, his successor rejected his teachings and stopped producing his written materials. This was one of those books. We responded to its lawsuit by filing our own counterclaim, seeking to reprint and distribute 18 additional works of Mr. Armstrong's that we consider central to our beliefs. The Missing Dimension in Sex is one of those 18 works. There simply is no other book like it. When you read it, you will understand why. Oh, I'm so fucking excited. As Mr. Armstrong explained in Read This First, he began working on this book in 1949 under the name God Speaks Out on the new morality. So that was the original title of this book, not the missing dimension in sex. It was God speaks out on the new morality. At that time, a cultural revolution was sweeping across the Western world. The revolt is on, Mr. Armstrong wrote, against prudery, against repression, and against ignorance. The world had prudery. gone from saying nothing about sex to saying everything. But much of it was wrong. This new knowledge, he said, was wholly physical. None of the so-called authorities approached the subject of sex from a biblical foundation. That's why the fruits of the revolution have been so evil. In 1971, seven years after the book's release, Mr. Armstrong published it under its new name, The Missing Dimension in Sex. By that point, the whole moral climate of society had changed. It had changed so much and for the worse, he felt it absolutely necessary to revise and update the book, even though it proved to be very costly. As you probably know, Mr. Armstrong gave away his books free of charge to those who requested them. To print nearly half a million copies, he wrote in 1971, was a huge undertaking. He had to give up probably one of his personal uh, private jets. Poor guy. I could handle a huge undertaking right about now. The way this book's <laughs> going, I think we could all use a huge undertaking. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> How huge of an undertaking? That was my question. <laughs> because, <laughs> because sometimes you need small undertakings to fit into smaller crevices. But <laughs> you never know wherever that just went. So um, 
But, May I just but say I love thing. board crevices. <laughs> 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 so all I was going to say was it hurts my heart that to think that Herbert Armstrong might have had to actually had had to settle for first class on a commercial, a commercial airliner. I, know. I, I mean, know. the humanity to allow God's prophet to have such humble places to be. Yeah. How dare Being you. stuck oh, with all oh, those heathens. The salt of the earth. Is that it's a white mystery. <laughs> <laughs> this is ridiculous. Aww. <laughs> In 1980, just before Mr. Armstrong released his third and final revision of the book, the one that we are reading today, uh, he underscored the book's importance that parents sorely need this knowledge. It's plain enough once you see it in your Bible. Single people need it. Youths need it. Children need right teaching from parents. But most parents either could not properly teach their children or else have felt too embarrassed. Teenagers need proper knowledge, yet heretofore, it has not been available to them. In this age of pressures toward things like promiscuity, blinded by false teachings, adolescents cannot be expected to resist premarital sex unless their minds are open to intelligent acceptance of God's purposes and laws for our good. For a more abundant and truly pleasurable and happy life. I would like to say that I think children who understand the realities of sex and its consequences will make better choices. It's the fucking teaching of abstinence that's the problem because then right. they don't actually know how to deal with it. But Patty, what is that is still going to be there? Patty, what is that term you mentioned that people that if they're told they should not or cannot do something, they're going to want to do it all the more? Oppositional defiant disorder? I don't know. Thank you. <laughs> something, something like that. Yeah. I mean, that's one of those that I think we all have a little bit of, and we just call it a disorder when it's like really getting in the way of life. It goes on to say, married people also need this knowledge if their marriage is to be preserved and happy. This book is about much more than sex. It's a guidebook for living. It's about God's purpose for man and how he is fulfilling that purpose through love, marriage, and sex. Take Mr. Armstrong's advice and read it and reread it from beginning to end. You do know that I am the equivalent of a saint. Hot. Anyway. You guys, so, we could play a Would You Rather game, Bible edition. Bible edition and WCG edition. Would you rather sing in the choir? <laughs> <laughs> Would you rather serve as an usher or, <laughs> or give the sermonette? They didn't like it when I gave my sermonette. Turned out I talked about Allah. I didn't Oh, know. yeah, that's right. That's so <laughs> funny. Yeah. That's you so quoted funny. Robin Hood. Prince of Thieves, yeah. Yes. Allah loves wondrous variety. It made fucking sense to me on a speech about racism. <laughs> and then the whole church was looking at me like, oh, shit, who's going to tell her? Did you understand? Well, like, oh shit! Who's going to tell them that Allah is just the generic term for God? Exactly. That's funny because that's how I took it at the time. <laughs> this is Armstrong's "Read This First" section. If ever the Western world needed a book, it needs this one now. In no area of human life has there been such a drastic social change as in that of sex. The so-called new morality first unleashed by World War I, intensified by World War II, completely KO'd Western civilization during the decades of the 50s, 60s, and 70s. I just want to say that I appreciated that KO'd was in there. I thought that was like modern gamer speak. So I was like, mm -hmm. oh, well, look how hip they are. Okay. Prior to the First World War, it was illegal in the United States to publish, sell, or distribute a book of instruction on the subject of sex. After World War I, an avalanche of books, pamphlets, magazines, and newspaper articles teachings on sex descended on the public. 
I'm just imagining people out in the street, like looking up as like sex books are falling down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yet in all of this, the most vitally needed dimension of knowledge was missing. During the 50s, 60s, 70s, and into the 80s, sex has been hurled at the public in every manner, in movies, television, in all advertising, in TV commercials, everywhere sex came to be freely talked about. Morals relaxed. The new morality became accepted by society. Divorces escalated. Which I'm just going to say that that was um, women having a choice and getting out of shitty situations in a way that they didn't before that. Family and home life became almost non-existent, yet a solid family structure is the very foundation of a stable and enduring society. There has floated abroad the delusion that whatever is new and different is more progressive and modern and therefore better. Far more often, it is retrogression. The purposes and true meaning of both sex and marriage are extremely vital to know. Physical details can be rightly understood only in the light of what has gone before in this volume. This astonishing knowledge, especially as presented in the earlier and middle chapters of this book, is as vital as it is surprising. It is important to read this book in its rightful order, beginning with chapter one. As opposed to what? Read. As opposed to looking at the table of contents and being like, oh, let me go to the sec section where they talk about shoving it in. <laughs> Maybe like that's the part did. they struggle with. They need like to understand. What? I just figured it out. I just figured it out. That's why we haven't discovered the missing dimension is because we didn't start with read this first. We didn't start the right way, guys. Now we are going down the right righteous path. Yes. Oh, thank goodness. Order. Good. I'm glad. I wouldn't want to be unrighteous. <laughs> see, 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 I am gleaning from Armstrong's genius here. Right, right. We'll find the value yet, huh? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> and I'm glad that we're going directly to the source. Apparently, there's no other book like this one, and we can't find this information anywhere else. So, oh, we are we're very privileged to have be to be reading this right now. So was it can I just say, last, what, uh, go ahead? Oh, I was. Was it the last episode that you said he sounded like Trump? Yes, uh -huh. mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right, go ahead. I, I, that's all I had to say. Oh yeah, no, that's okay. Um, oh, I was thinking that I have kind of skimmed through this book, and there's a lot of places where this idea of this dimension that has been missing, and now you will finally know. Yeah. And I still haven't figured out when, like, how many times they need to say that before they get to, like, okay, the missing dimension is the whole. That's a marketing tactic. Armstrong used it all the time. He said, try to draw people out for as long as possible. It's kind of like the way that a yeah. novel works, right? Like people want to to know what's what's going to happen. Ooh, is the it, suspense. But then you, you mean like edge player. Yes. <laughs> Yep. He's just edging us the whole time. That's what's happening. Just getting edged. Right right up to it. And just the just tip. Back right off. Regardless of how much knowledge the reader may have acquired on the subject, he will find much that is new to him in this book. And he will come to see this entire subject in an entirely new light. The impetus which started research and gathering a material for this book in 1949 was the need to produce our own textbook for the Principles of Living course in Ambassador College. However, the accelerating demand from the constantly enlarging readership of the plain truth, what was enlarging? Now nearly 3 million subscribers in all parts of the world necessitated preparation of a work for the instruction of this vast number of people in all walks of life and in all levels of education. Purposely, therefore, we have avoided the staid, dry, pedantic, professorial language of scholarship, which seems typical of the average university level textbook. I will say I think this is a thing that Armstrong used and did on purpose, that he made sure his language was accessible to the proletariat. 
Oh, he he mentions that in one of his other books, too. He says this is literally it was in his autobiography. He literally said, you have to talk as though you're talking to like a third grader or something like that so that you get out to, to, to more people. So I mean, just, he's not wrong, but also to say that out loud is like kind of rude. I am a huge language nerd. And one of the things I love to do is to translate things in a way that makes sense, in a way that actually can be accessible to the public by and large. We don't like, as a society, reading things that are heavy. We are not all Hermione right. Granger mm -hmm. who check out these gigantic books for a bit of light reading. And so we do like, so I do think that he is actually catering to some, something that is societ societally desired is the lack of over like uh, over the top language um but things that are presented plainly and simply but that actually yeah i can actually understand why he says that so um mm -hmm. yeah, I, yeah i understand I too i understand too the negative implications of that saying what are you saying that like yeah he's making this for the proletariat that type of situation but uh, but the thing is, though, it's like, yeah, but when you read Marxist literature, too, isn't the purpose to make the proletariat like the 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 say givers? So I, I, I think it's you're right. Uh, I think it's a tactic. I think it's a tactic. So, yeah. And it's not it's not like an inherently evil tactic, I don't think, because it, to reach people where they're at is important. Mm -hmm. But how you say that that's what you're doing, I think, can uh, make or break perception of you. Yeah. He knew advertising and he wanted to make sure that other people kind of had some feeling of what his tactics were. I mean, he took pride in them. All right. So he goes on to say such writing may inflate the intellectual vanity of the author. OK, that's fair. I'll own that one because I use big words and I'm like, yeah, that's right. I fucking use big words. OK, fair. Fine. I'll take that one. But it is our purpose to convey knowledge to the reader. The purpose of words is to convey meaning. We have tried to make this text as plain and understandable as it is frank. We have endeavored to make it easy to read. This work has been produced out of genuine concern and deep compassion for a humanity robbed by false teachings, as well as by ignorance of the joys, the delights, and the rich blessings which have been made possible. But these may be ours today if only we will open our minds to receive what has been missing until now read and reread it from beginning to end with a clean heart, a right spirit, and an understanding mind, and you will be richly rewarded. And now we can begin. The forward, the read this first, and now we're finally to the introduction. Sex in the 80s. Where have six decades brought us? Okay, so <laughs> before I continue, just remember this marvelously old man writing <laughs> this material. Okay. I wonder if and we should I'm put a picture do... of him from the late 40s. <laughs> he was a bit strapping. I am not going to say he wasn't. He was slightly strapping. But um, I'm going to read. So, so. Just just imagine this wonderfully delightful old man writing this book. My voice is his internal dialogue, okay? So just 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 let you know this is what he'd be thinking, okay? Okay. The world has emerged from the age of a moral revolution has swept the world. Few under 30 have any conception of what the previous 4,000 year long world was like. Few over 30 are aware of the extent to which the new morality has progressed in reverse. Little was known about sex. The subject was never discussed. It was unlawful in the United States to publish, sell, or distribute any knowledge about sex or teaching in its use. Certainly young married people Sorely needed proper information. After World War I, the legal dam, the legal dam, was removed. The floodgates against published sex information opened. An avalanche of books, magazine, and newspaper articles flooded over the United States like a tidal wave. One can hardly... It, <laughs> it got wet. One can hardly pick up a mess. <laughs> <laughs> One can hardly pick up a magazine on a newsstand that does not feature at least one article on sex. The it's medical like doctors, the gynecologists, the psychoanalysts, the sexologists, 
ground out authoritative books conveying information and teaching on the subject of sex. Yet, in all this dissemination, the, all caps, most essential dimension of knowledge was missing. Head <gasps> What was it? Do tell us, Mr. Armstrong. <laughs> it is called the clitoris. Oh, no. <laughs> is it actually pronounced clitoris or clitoris? I've heard both. I've heard both. I've especially heard both when, um, who was it? Uh, Gilbert Gottfried called it clitoris. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah. it was, yeah, like where he actually narrated Fifty Shades of Grey. Oh. <laughs> and he said, uh, so horrifying. He, said clitoris. <laughs> he actually said it like this, clitoris! <laughs> so <that's> <laughs> it has remained for this present volume to reveal that all-important dimension, its real meaning and purposes. Imagine if it was the clitoris, right? Like, it is remain for this present volume to reveal that all-important dimension, its real meaning and purposes. Okay, if we get to the end of this book and we're like, oh my god, it was the clitoris is the missing dimension, I will actually amazing? take back so much of the bad things I've said and I'll be like, actually, that guy deserves some credit. It's actually very educational stuff in this book. It really yeah. is. Yeah. yeah. Well, good. We'll learn some things and also have some bad things to say. It's good. But he literally says in the book that clitoral stimulation is immature. That's remember? true. So I, I mean, doubt he's going to go there. That. But he's is it because gonna... Is it because it looks like a tiny version of his two-inch one? <laughs> I remember seeing a billboard once that asked the question if you could ask jesus any question what would it be and somebody spray painted in there he said why is my g-spot up my ass <laughs> <laughs> i actually have a meme about that where it's just like why is like the most intense pleasure spot like hidden up the place where most men will never dare to go and and then there's like this uh and it's the meme of like the the lady saying oh my goodness i just did that that's so random i'm so i'm so crazy <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> Or oh why God. are our pleasure why are our pleasure parts next to our poopy parts? Explain mm -hmm. that. Like yep. yeah. amusement yep. park next to the garbage dump. Yeah, it's weird. And oh. we breathe and eat out of the same fucking device. I'm sorry. <laughs> device. We also do a lot of other things with the same device, just letting you know. Yeah, that's true. But you I mean, it's a perfect people. creation. God made all of this absolutely perfectly. So this missing dimension in knowledge has not been revealed by religion, by the medical fraternity, by the authorities on the subject, nor by higher education. You will find it only in this book. Do not <laughs> glance over the and past that portion of this book. It is a million times more valuable than the technical, physical knowledge. The latter, without the former, can be ultimately disastrously fatal. For this is, in true fact, the most important and necessary book ever published on sex. It's really funny how this and is like the it. most important book ever written because I am amazing. Although I say I'm not amazing, but I am amazing. Send me yeah, he, he really didn't hold back <laughs> on uh, promoting yeah. himself. <laughs> I love that section later on where that lady is like telling him, oh, Mr. Armstrong, so you're so amazing. And I worship the ground you walk on. And I love you. You're amazing. It, it's like, it, it, and she was so right. But anyway, um, that's that's the attitude that I get from him. But anyway, mm -hmm. uh, today we live in a... What, what? Just his humble self. Oh, of course. <laughs> well, greetings, friends. Anyway, today, today we live in a different world. D disgust and almost as promiscuously indulged. Good for them. But the new freedom is by no means limited to the sexual response. The modern plunge <laughs> has dived much <laughs> deeper. <laughs> 
<laughs> then even a modern society is aware. First, I have an idea. Can we all three take turns reading that one sentence? The modern plunge has dived much deeper than even a modern society is aware. The modern plunge has dived much deeper than even a modern society is aware. The modern plunge has dived much deeper than even a modern society is aware. See, you you two, I like your voices a lot. And I know that that's a very common thing that we hate the sound of our own voices. But my goodness, you can talk into the microphone all day and I'd be like so seductive if I were straight. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> talking in tongues, the seductive edition. Today we live in a different world, oh, we are, but the new freedom is, oh, we already read that. Okay. First, take a swift overview of progress after a year in the 80s. Then, a surprise to those of 30 and below, glance back into the pre World War years as it had been for some 4,000 years. Our camera zooms now into the Western world, but the, the better half of the world, just so that way you're aware. Um, our camera zooms now into the Western world before and after two divergent human society. The contrast ought to arouse. Are we aroused yet? Arisen? <laughs> For, we <laughs> For we have... <laughs> <laughs> the, the contrast ought to arouse the reader to sober thought, but will it? Or have we become too lukewarm to be concerned? Oh, that damn Laodicea church it is our downfall. Our own future and eternity hangs in the balance. Today's condition and trend is so frightening in what it pretends it ought to shock every individual out of com uh, complacency into desperate action to reverse the ominous tide. <laughs> but the facts of life as we speed through the 80s have not hit us suddenly in the 24-hour day or a single week. The deadly contrast is not so apparent because it came on us gradually over a period of six decades to... Wait, it did what? It... <laughs> yes! It... <laughs> because it came on us gradually. It was a slow trickle, okay? Oh, God. <laughs> okay, I'm really sorry I said that now. <laughs> <laughs> it was a really slow trickle over a period of six decades. Two full generations. That was one. Gross. The new morality world has was spawned after the turn of the century. It developed from the embryo stage during World War I. It surged mostly among teens. It surged among teens unnoticed by their parents on past world uh, on past World War II. The emergence of television after that war gave the trend great impetus. Acceleration sped the downward plunge. The new morality really surfaced during the 60s, blossomed into flu bloom in the 70s. But where are we now after a year into the 80s? In the United States, what? Okay, all of this is caps. One million teenage girls unmarried get pregnant every year. Okay, end of caps. Um, conditions in England, Sweden, and Western Europe rival this. John, two John Hopkins University professors in a very recent study report that 50% of the nation's teenage girls ages 14 to 19 have had premarital sex. The horror. The survey showed the percentage has significantly increased since 1971. Today, with the avalanche, he likes to say avalanche, that's the third time so far, of sex <laughs> literature and sex education published since World War I, and with sex everywhere. I mean, quite literally, you cannot walk a step outside without seeing people having sex. <laughs> sex. Sex everywhere. Sex. And you get sex, and you get sex, and you get sex. Sex for everyone. Today, with the avalanche of sex literature and sex education published since World War I, and with sex everywhere, freely discussed, the teens are indeed wise in sexual discussion and sexual experience, but still woefully ignorant in sex knowledge. I just realized something. Hmm. You can't have wisdom without knowledge, so that doesn't even make sense. 
Because, like, what is, like, the common church thing? It's, like, you got knowledge and understanding and, like, the two combined make knowledge, uh, make, make wisdom. It, like, that's, like, the basic Proverbs understanding of what wisdom is. So it's, like, okay, so, like, you put your, your understanding and knowledge to practice and that's wisdom. So if te teens are indeed wise. Now, I understand he put that in quotes, but it doesn't make sense if they're ignorant on knowledge, but yet they're wise in sex. Anyway, so right. well, but isn't that isn't that indicative of how he did it? It's like you can be super smart, you can have degrees, you can think you know things, but you but the don't. secrets in this book, yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. Nowhere else, nowhere else has <laughs> nowhere mankind else. gotten so far astray. So Syracuse University professor Saul Gordon says fewer than 10% of all teenagers have been given any school sex education. And of course, they received little or none from their parents. Wait a second. Is he actually saying that it's good to have sex education in school? I mean, it kind of seems like he is. He's yeah talking about their ignorance, but then also saying that the stuff they teach is bullshit kind of so i but he know. said it's because it's kids teaching kids like the blind leading the blind essentially mm -hmm. but oh. but the thing is though it's like it sounds like he's advocating for sex education which i remember i personally was pulled out of sex education oh. so no. but it seems like he's also in the parts we've already read saying how terrible it is that this stuff is just discussed at school and in the open and whatever yeah, in like literature what, like, and stuff it's like you can't have your cake and eat it too. It's Howard, like... I did tell you guys that he goes back and forth on a lot of different subjects yes, here. You and did. he contradicts himself a lot. So this right. is my question though. I was born into this, and I believe Nancy was born into it, correct? We both were. We both were. You both were actually born. Okay. I have a question. Put ourselves back into like the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. Would we, given the information that we would have known at the time, we didn't have internet and all that stuff, how do you think we would have been in terms of, like, listening to to propaganda machine tools like this? Like, how would we have interacted with it? Right. Like, because you said, Nancy, that he sounds very convincing, and I agree with you. He actually has a lot of Trump characteristics, which I understand why mm -hmm. people like like him. So it's like, so my question is, though, like, how do you think, do you think that we would still have the same reactions to him the way that we are now? Because we, we, um, uh, let's say that we were out, we were the Gentiles and we heard the good news that he presented. How would we react to it? Even when Patty and I were growing up, we couldn't really have a voice and the times are changing where they're saying, not just women, but I'm going to use the example of women couldn't really be heard back in this day they just kind of had to follow along with whatever the patriarchy said and now that times are changing um we probably just would have gone along with everything back then because what choice would we have had yeah i mean i kind of think even in the 80s when we grew up if if my parents hadn't sent us to public school i don't know how i would have had enough um, other inputs in my mind to get out of it like you know because we're just about, we're like a product of our experiences right i'm talking about i'm not talking about being in the call i'm talking about oh. if we had never been born into it oh, would we yeah, have okay. listened to his uh ramblings as something to listen to i would not I don't think no i don't think there's a I way to know so though but i, I think I, there kind of is because I hear people like that today. Well, that's true. But to say, would I have fallen for it? I don't think I can know because I think the people that did fall for it and indoctrinate their children into it had a set of experiences in their life that set them up to be vulnerable to the style that Armstrong used, right? Because it's a little bit like, I, I'm an important man and you need to listen to me. And it was the right. way, you know, he emulated men that were actually important at that time and like took that style and just totally did the like fake it till you make it kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And people believed him and he knew that if he projected that image, people would believe him. And I mean, look at how he's writing this book. 
Like there's a whole lot of like, there's stuff that you don't know and wouldn't you like to do things right? And, um, and he's, we, we're already finding where he's saying things that are inherently contradictory the way he's saying it. So that that's sets what up I'm saying. like, mm-hmm. well, but I think that's like, like, I think that that actually causes confusion if you're not ready to stand outside of it and see what he's doing. Right. Mm-hmm. Because if you're already in a place of like, well, he's telling me I need to know this stuff and he's saying this and he's saying this. I think your brain's going to try to make sense of it instead of yeah. stepping back and being like, well, fuck, those don't even go together. I think I think what you're saying is like we as human beings prefer to give the benefit of the doubt. And and I think that's that's something that I can see there as well. Um, however, I think um, for, for me, in my perspective, when I see contradictions like that, when I see like two or three, I'm done. It, like it, it's like if I'm actually it, the moment I get to that point in a very quick succession, I'm like, nope, I'm done. My ears are closed. Um, it's like I will still probably hear the words. Like if I'm in a situation where I have to hear the words, but it's like, but my ears are turned off to persuasion. <clears throat> but this goes back, Patty, to what you were discussing in another episode of ours. Um, <clears throat> we need to learn how to believe in true things. How do we figure out things that are true? And people that constantly feel like they don't have a voice and um, their opinion does not matter. How are they going to discover the truth? They, they have questions that they feel afraid to ask. I think it's more than that though. They're just in a place of like, I need to feel safe and doing yeah. these things that these important people told me to do. They told me I'll be safe then. And they said it so authoritatively that my brain doesn't have anything or other knowledge to go outside of that. And so there's so much effort, I think, from me as a child and maybe other people stuck in culty things too, of like, I'm just watching everyone's reactions to what I'm doing to make sure that I'm behaving in a way that everyone thinks is okay, because I don't want someone to think I'm not doing the right thing because that gets back to someone and then I'm in trouble or like fully existential, like I'm going to hell kind of stuff. Fear right. And so I think that that place of being fearful and needing to like check with everyone to make sure that you're okay and doing the right things. I think that puts you in a place where you can't step back and be like, Hey, look, the stuff they're saying is contradictory because you're just trying, your brain's trying to make sense of it so you can be safe. I got to hold this right. and I got to hold this and somehow that's got to work or I'm going to yeah, not be from a, You're talking from a child's perspective and and I completely agree with you on that because uh, I'm thinking, I don't I'm sitting think here right it now thinking stops about, at childhood. No, no. I, I think that's something that like, I just hit, you just hit something I was, uh, I was just thinking about last night. Like, so I like to sit by myself and ponder all the existential questions um and the uh last night i literally was thinking about our childhood experiences are full of us looking around just what you said pats like looking around taking on the characteristics and traits of the people that we see around us mimicking them to a point and it never really stops it never gets to the point where we actually are able to to think for ourselves unless we are predisposed to do well if I say that, then it's going to sound as if I feel as if there's some better race out there. And I'm not saying that whatsoever. What I'm saying is it's just like there are some people who are just like, wait, like this is just like this constant cycle of the same, same, same. And then something happens that triggers like how 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 we think in that way. And so I just know I just very much agree with everything you just said there, which happened for us. Because the shelf broke finally to the point where it was like all over the floor and there were splinters everywhere and there was even broken glass and I had to sweep it up and then I had to be careful because I had to keep my socks on because I didn't want to rip myself on the glass down there. And then there was like all these broken pieces of wood and I was like, I don't like it that all these broken pieces of wood are down there because it's like, I like my wood to be all together, not not, not separate. No. <laughs> you like your wood, how? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It was not the time for that. <laughs> I like my meat rare. I like my meat dark, Joel. It's like the airplane thing. It's like, I'll take my coffee black like my man. (laughs) (laughs) Is that what you're into, Joel? No, actually. No, I am not. And now we awkwardly sit and wait for you to say what you are into. (laughs) (laughs) I'm just kidding. You don't have to. Really like Middle Eastern and Indian. Oh. Oh. That explains some things. They are wise in their own conceits.
like the boy whose father, in agitated embarrassment, said, Johnny, I think it's time we had a talk about sex. For some reason, I have like a 1950s PSA in my head right now. It's like, you know, it's like, all right, Johnny, I think it's time we had a talk about sex. Fine, Dad, <laughs> came the answer. What would you like to know? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's so funny. <laughs> sex ignorance is testified is testies oh no i'm sorry testified <laughs> by the fact <laughs> what what um that, that is actually related to testicles testify oh it was oh really? yes it came from like a like a uh there was like a bro dude let's shake on it except we're gonna like dude. We're gonna like put our hand in your thighs, you know, like by the test. Well, this is the thing. That's that's what people think the biblical put your hand under my thigh meant. Yeah, but it was a thing. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that's where yep. we get the word testify, literally. Yeah, it makes sense. Yep, testify. Yeah. I honestly thought it was related to testing or trying. <laughs> Sex ignorance is testified by the fact of two hundred and fifty thousand reported adolescent gonorrhea. Not long ago, a third of marriages in the United States resulted in divorce. Today, the divorce rate has swelled to one half of all marriages. The foundational bulwark of any healthy, stable, and permanent society is the family unit. Before World War I, it was a rare... I'm sorry, this is getting, it's getting iffy for me. So it was a rare married woman who worked away from home. I remember during World War I, my own surprise at seeing. <sighs> women employed <laughs> for the first time as Elevator operators. I mean, they can't even drive. I'm, oh, I'm sorry. That's not part of the book. Shocking. <laughs> <laughs> in the Marshall Field store in Chicago, such jobs never had been for women. Today, only 13% of U.S. families include a working father, homemaking mother, and one or more children. What would an Abraham Lincoln think of that? Or even a Theodore Roosevelt. Or a Woodrow Wilson. Would they not turn over in their graves if they knew? Patty, I'm <laughs> happy that we're reading through this book because now you see his exact words. Well, why the heck is he bringing up old presidents? Like, he's got I such just... a bent toward, like, old, white, important men. He idolized them, especially Benjamin Franklin. Well, I do know one of them would not touch black children. Um, I know one of them, uh, what, Theodore. I think Teddy was the one that did a horrible mess in the Panama Canal. Um, and so, yeah, it was, yeah, they, these, these characters are not always reputable. Can I back up for uh, a second, too? The little bit you had said about gonorrhea up there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Like he's talking about adolescents, and I'm sure he wasn't wrong about those that data. But did you know the biggest problem for where uh, STDs are happening now that they have to be addressing is in nursing homes? <gasps> and I'm not kidding. I've heard about this. Another one. I got another. I'm one. kind of delighted by it, to be honest. The villages, the villages in Florida, really bad. <laughs> I support old people getting their freak on. You know, like how like the gays in the uh, the gay agenda. Um, the gays in like the 1970s had like a color coded um, uh, armband thing that they would use to like signal to other people. It would be like uh, things that they would put in their pockets or on their arms to signal to other men mm -hmm. who are in the know about what they're into. Yeah, and I'm aware of the so chief code. They've done the same thing with loofahs over in the villages. It is, it is very much part of the town culture. With the retired folks. Yes. And so a lot of these people live in trailers. So what they'll do is they'll stick a loofah like in the front window of their trailer. Or like in their mailbox. Oh, or like in their plant areas. Yeah. And then so what they'll do is and the it's an open door policy. 
so it's like they can just like go ahead and get going because it's uh, yeah because it's a uh, yeah. What if somebody has that color by mistake? And that kind of reminds me of the if you upside down know. pineapple. This is very popular with people that take their RVs out and go to campsites. They put the upside down pineapple to signal that they are swingers. That's kind of cool. Little <laughs> secret secret languages. Anyway, so um, the over two and a half million American men and women avoid marriage altogether. That's totally their choice. Nancy, you need to birth some children. How about you go uh, fuck yourself, Joel? Every <laughs> <laughs> day. <laughs> <laughs> so, yet live it's even hot in here. <laughs> <laughs> Over two and a half million American men and women avoid marriage altogether, yet they live together. They live among us. Either as unmarried heterosexuals or as homosexuals. Oh no. By 1990, a virgin, yes, a virgin, standing at the marriage altar will be a phenomenon. Many ask today, you know what's funny? Here we are in 2024. And I know of a wedding that's happening this coming Saturday. Mm -hmm. So, um, and there's like a we got a virgin sitting at the marriage altar. Um, I'm not gonna make any projections, but it's just like uh, I, I I I I don't think it's a phenomenon. So there, it, like you know what I mean? It's yeah. Anyway, anyway. Yeah. Virgin like, is a social that... construct anyway. It's not a real I, it really thing. is. It really is. But anyway, so yeah. is marriage. What? What? <laughs> okay, listen to my manly authority. Okay. <laughs> Um, uh, many ask today, why marriage at all anyway? Some experts say marriage will soon be a thing of the past. I wish. There is today a definite conspiracy. Well, actually, I don't wish that marriage will be a thing of the past, but I, I think that the way things are going is pretty nice. Um, but anyway, there is definitely a definite, cons uh, today a definite conspiracy active on television, in newspapers, in universities to do away with the institution of marriage. Although most people in the 80s will Can marry we... at least. Oh, that's it. Right. That's it. Yeah, sorry. I didn't even realize. Sorry, Joel. Either. The vaginas over here need their voices heard. <laughs> Go ahead, Pats. We, well, we maybe, both had our hands maybe up. Maybe the vaginas <laughs> should stop changing their mind on what sections we read. Talking about, women, talking about women and their indecisive ways. Because oh, you know what happened God. the last time? You know what happened the last time they made a decision for a man? They got kicked out of a garden. Oh my fucking god. <laughs> <laughs> At least the woman had a mind of her own. She wasn't a huge oh. pussy and went along with the masses. <laughs> Easily manipulated. How, how are you liking that childbirth there, Nancy? <laughs> I wouldn't know. <laughs> I gave birth without drugs both times, so you can talk to me about those things. Hmm. Yeah, I did. Yeah, she did. Thank you for At pulling home. the vagina card out on me. I'll just go ahead and release this pent up. Oh, there we go. <laughs> the fuck was that? <laughs> yeah, what is it about vaginas changing their mind halfway through a situation? Hmm? Just saying. I don't even think that deserves a dignified response. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you know that silence is where you belong. Okay, now you can fuck all the way off. <laughs> Armstrong makes it seem like the institution of marriage going away is such a bad thing. My question is, who gives a fuck whether somebody else is married or not? That's the whole point. That's my whole point. Absolutely. I remember the way married people used to look at me. When I was single, especially the women, they looked at me as if I was going to do something with their husbands. You want to get them married off as soon as possible. That's what society has been saying. If it's any consolation, I get asked about that a lot by people who don't know that I've gone the single route. Um, um, 
And so like, it's funny because I'm still in some areas because um, I'm very much involved with the Chinese community. Um, and I feel as if I can actually talk about my life a little bit now. And uh, what's funny is um, their thoughts on homosexuality and stuff like that are, are, are it, it, it can depend. I mean, there's like a whole range of different uh, opinions, but you also have very traditional minded. And, and so it's like, not everybody knows. And so I often get asked by people who might just meet for the first time or stuff like that. Cause like, I'm now 34 and it's like, wait, you're not married yet. Why aren't you married yet? And all that, all that type of stuff. And it happens all the time. It's so funny. It's like, I'm used to it by this point, but it's sad that it is societally expected. I have the same problem, Joel, with people telling me that I need to have children. Here I am in my early 40s. My husband has had a visectomy. I never changed my mind all throughout my life. I always said I never wanted children, never desired them. I still have people to this day telling me I am going to change my mind and have kids. See, see, Nancy, Pat knows how to defer to a man. Just saying. I was trained well. No, like I literally have to retrain myself out of it because I think I do yeah, it automatically horrible. without even noticing. Joel. I'm getting a popsicle. All right, moving on. Though most people in the 80s will marry at least once. At least once. There will be a broad variety of options. This will include living alone by choice. Mm. Though by no means will it include sex. It will include single parentage by women. Unmarried twosomes, both heterosexual and homosexual. It will include communal living and unrelated families. The number of unmarried couples living today doubled in the 70s. Scandalous. I know. Today, authorities say change in partnership may be seen as predictable, understandable, even desirable. We'll back away from the notion of lifelong marriage. Yes. And if we looked at ourselves the way we look at animals and like study their social stuff and whatever, yeah. we would say that humans most naturally uh, are serial monogamists. <laughs> loosening attitudes towards sex. You know, loosening. Shout the expert conspirators will help propel these changes. With legalized abortion and improved contraception coming into the 80s horizons are an anti-pregnancy vaccine, birth control implants under the skin, and a birth control pill <gasps> for men. Only one of those three things has happened. And yeah. this is scandalous. Sex will be equated with fun, pleasure, and enjoyment, not babies oh what have you guys ever played bible trivia yeah we have an a, a whole episode on it oh yeah freedom from religion foundation no i actually yeah. remember you guys talking about how you also played the board game and um the uh i i have to say when talking about jeremiah one of the questions is about jeremiah what did the lord tell like who, who did the lord tell that he could not um uh do whatever whatever i forget exactly the question but it's jeremiah he was told by the lord that he could not have children and that he could not get married or, or, or I, both of those things and so our our way of remembering like the answer to that question was by saying no ladies no babies and and <laughs> <laughs> it is very clear in the bible that sex is also equated to fun and pleasure it very much is and so, yeah, I mean, anyway, I just said that Solomon, there. hello. Okay, Armstrong reiterates that in his book, that it's not just about making babies. So, again, it's just one of the many contradictions he has in this book. Right, he's clearly against it being for fun and enjoyment here. Well, that's what he says here. But again, I, I feel like he appropriates and plagiarizes shit so much, which we'll get into. And then he just throws out all these statistics at you. Like you said, Joel, throwing shit at the wall and seeing what sticks. Joel. That was Patty that said that, throwing oh, shit at the sorry. wall and seeing what sticks. Yeah, I think that was actually her. <laughs> I? See, I will actually let you know when 
praise towards me is not is not necessary, but I will absolutely allow other praise to come in. How magnanimous of you. Since it is a basic truism that a solid family structure is the foundational bulwark of any stable and permanent society, this fact means only one thing, in all caps. Civilization as we know it is on the way down. Unless that great unseen strong hand from someplace, in quotations, by the way, soon intervenes and saves today's sick society. <laughs> I will let you read into that sentence all you want. That was good. Oh, well, he did. Yeah, he, he did. did. <laughs> but before we leave the world scene of the 1980s, Bear in mind, the present world in revolt is in rebellion against much more than the pre-20th century sex repression. And the modern downward spiral of humanity involves a much wider area than sexual. I, I swear he put in words on purpose like this. Yeah, he you know he did. He totally did. Today, the family structure of Western life is endangered by much more than illicit and promiscuous sex. Why is he only concerned with Western society? We're going to delve into I, right. I already said that, it uh, did you not hear my addition earlier on, that it is the right society? Well, I don't give a fuck what he thinks what the right society is. There's an entire world we're talking about here. Along with the modern sex rampage of adolescence, has come other addictions that titillate, arouse, stimulate, and please the physical senses. Accompanying sexual indulgence has come in teen life, alcohol, drugs, tobacco, modern X-rated movies, not old ones, gangsterism, and violence. They look for every pleasing, stimulating sensation. Some appeal to the sense of feel, some to sight, <laughs> some to hearing, some like to watch, some to hearing like rock and disco music. Ooh. I mean, rock and roll definitely meant sex at first. Rock and roll. With rolling, that baby. sensual beat and the rhythm, some to the sense of smell, like sniffing panties. I'm sorry. That's kind <laughs> of a kink with some people. Okay. He's got a point. <laughs> People smell tobacco smoke. Cigarette ads speak only of taste, but you cannot taste smoke. Uh, but, not true. It's a random little tidbit, but he does mention that in his autobiography as well, meeting some people that were... That doesn't some, make sense. I, I know. Hey, but, I lived in Beijing for years, and I could taste the pollution. <laughs> he has no idea what he's talking about scientifically. Because most of our taste is smell. Mm -hmm. The only things we taste are like bittersweet, salty. The movies bring pleasure through the sense of sight and sound. Kids spend hours a day before the one-eyed monster. By the way, <laughs> he's referring to one-eyed monster as the television set. That is totally a dick joke. It the provides a ready-made daydream. So I grew up mostly in the 90s. And, uh, like, the series, like, all of that and stuff like that were really popular when I was a kid. And um, so it was talking about things that they would try to slide in, like, these really inappropriate jokes that they would try to actually slide into the... Because we've heard about, like, the Little Mermaid potentially having, like, dildos, like, in, uh, like you know that stuff, right? So I'm actually wondering if he's doing that here. I, I really think so. <gasps> Particularly like the goosebumps. because... The Goosebumps books. What about them? Read if you read, the, you know those books from like... I grew it? up on them. I learned how to read on them. What about them? Who's I haven't heard books? this. You don't know all the sexual innuendo in those? Not the really? sexual innuendo, no. Patty, you and sexual I Sexual as fuck. There was yeah. a... Are we... I don't... Yeah, there was one I read. I had never read The Goosebumps, so one of my kids got it from the library, and I started reading, and I was like... Really? Uh, I, I was, really I was that shocked. Bad. 
It was something because, about like a tongue or something. Like it was like a giant scary tongue, whatever that. Oh, was. I know what that one is. That's the one where they're typing a story and the the things are coming to life. And there was and things a are monster. Pulsating. There was a blob with a pulsating thing and stuff like that. Yeah, that was like a standalone story. But anyway, that's like the like. But I have to like look into that now because I've never heard of the Goosebumps books being called. But anyway. But yeah, yeah, if you're saying Goosebumps books, then yeah, yeah, like that. Because um, look at how he said, kids spend hours a day before the one-eyed monster. Right after that, it says, it provides a ready-made daydream. The one-eyed monster provides a ready-made daydream. Mm -hmm. Don't tell me that, maybe not here. Mm -hmm. I doubt it, but like uh, maybe not here. But... I think he's putting some things in there. I think he is too. Oh, yeah. Earlier there was a line that I was just like, um, there's no way you didn't put that all in there in one sentence on purpose. I And I know this because this is a writing tactic I have used because word selection matters, especially if you're aiming for a new window. Contrafuction. I can't even talk anymore. Okay. It's the contrafuction. Right. machine. The contrafuction. And misuse. <laughs> Not only dulls the mind, television has been a prime medium by which the anti-family conspiracy has injected its deadly poison into juvenile and adult minds. Make no mistake, television is an industry devoted to entertainment, in all caps, pure and simple. Of course, one finds... Occasionally on TV, a truly educational and or worthwhile program or documentary. Is he talking about the world tomorrow by chance? <laughs> but TV is a business for profit in America. It provides entertainment so that people have commercials, selling goods and services thrust before them. You fucking know he did this on purpose. You, you fucking agree. Know it. He did. He used the fucking word thrust Go. in here. Go up a few sentences, like we we're talking about the one-eyed monster, and it says, and then what does it say here? And misuse not only he's still talking about the fucking TV. And misuse not only dulls the mind, what it is that you play with that thing forever, you're gonna go blind. Anyway, he's making television. masturbation innuendos, is what he he's is. doing. Television oh. has been a prime medium by which the anti-family conspiracy has injected its deadly poison. Masturbation. He is Come referring the... to masturbation. Come the fuck on. My All turn. right. So we were talking about thrusting. Oh, yeah. The, the entertainers, even news announcers who are themselves primarily entertainers, say before a commercial break, Stay tuned. Or we'll be right back. Don't go away. The viewer is literally forced to allow the commercial huckster to inject, inject his sales pitch into the mind. Another modern evil, seldom recognized as such, is the working wife and mother. Family life has undergone a radical revolution, all caps. Teens have sex games at home in bed while dad and mom are at work. Children do not eat with parents. They seldom go to movies with parents. Parents have their lives, associates and friends apart from the children. Parents never think of teaching children, being with children, maintaining a family relationship. Parental responsibility is totally neglected. In due time, parents are going to be brought to account for this neglect of basic responsibility. I don't know that I disagree with him all the way on this because I've followed a fairly traditional way of doing things. And I think that children would benefit from having a close parent involved with them. But then also mm -hmm. that close parent, if was was a terrible person, then that's not good. So mm -hmm. anyway, yeah, I don't have a whole lot to say about that paragraph. I, yeah, I think that's fine to look at it um, from that perspective. And then at the same time, I have to wonder these kids that don't have you know a stable family structure what are they supposed to think they're say there's something wrong with me then i didn't have oh. that we can do better for children in general having good role models in their life and i don't right. think it has to be biologically connected parent all right joel you look like you have something misogynistic to say 
Do you want to go ahead? <laughs> no, actually. <laughs> no, I'm just thinking about some disgusting comments I heard before. One thing that I know people like to use uh, is the excuse of when God declares who he is in Exodus 34, there's a thing that says like how he will not, um, he does not forgive the guilty and that he will bring the sin of a generation onto the third and fourth. And the I've heard that used as an excuse, um, both in fundamentalist churches as well as in the WCG. I have heard when people are in such horrible positions where their parents are like not active in the family unit, it's because it's of the sins of the generations prior. And that that's why they're in the situation that they're in. And we're supposed to, it was like, it, uh, it, we were very, very superiority driven. And, and yeah. so when we looked at people who were going through, because you just posed the question, it's like, what about the kids that were in this situation? We probably would have said something like, well, they're still trapped in the sin of their previous generations. And it's like, I've totally heard shit like that before. Yeah. And it's like, it's like, instead of like actually having the wherewithal to fucking do something about it. Exactly. And I don't think it's wrong. Like the idea of a generational <clears throat> curse or something like I don't think it's wrong. I don't think it's spiritual. I think it's very uh, just natural of how life goes because parents harming their children and those children receiving that harm and passing it on like, hello, that's just how that works. But cause the thing is what we're well, cause and effect, but we're we're too geared to see it as a sin and try to blame the person who's stuck in that instead of understanding the larger context that put them in that situation to begin with. So it's it's a failing of ours in general to see us as a collection of individuals instead of a collective that should be working together for a better world. Not to mention it's also just uh, we, we have a we have very much, especially in American culture, the us versus them mentality. Yeah. and uh it's a huge deal and, and yeah. it's something that i think has affected us since since the settlers came over here from europe because we were, were a nation founded on uh, religious radicalism yes so. yeah and eradication of the people who were here mm, i have a lot of very choice words to say when it comes to shit like that and i know because what did we give them we gave them smallpox blankets and i actually know people personally who would still do shit like that? And oh, what? that's it, it's it, it, I I don't I'm not listing out names and stuff, but in my experiences throughout my 34 years of existence, I have actually met people who have talked about certain things that would not be adequate in a in a civilized discussion. Boy, that's unfortunate. I'm gonna resume. But you're gonna have a resume. I didn't <laughs> think women worked. Oh. <gasps> Oh, fuck you. Wow. Look who's being sassy. Thinks he's cute and funny. I mean, he is cute. But now, what a surprise for the what? under 30s. The young people of today have little awareness of the sex and family conditions in the pre-war years. In fact, until 1914, there had been little basic change for some 4,000 years. Yep. So people 4,000 years ago that had a stone dildo, little had changed. Let's just it was that. before 4,000 years, Patty. It was much older than that. Oh, that's true. I'm wondering, too, if he's also writing this to cater to the young earthers as well, because this book was meant to reach out to everybody. Yeah. Oh. Well, that explains before. his contradictions so people can see themselves in it, no matter yeah, what. Cam I all mean, we probably me did say that, but go ahead. Go ahead, Nancy. Sorry. No, I was just going to say all it takes is catching like one or two sentences that that kind of ruminate with them. And then I was like, oh, OK, he does know what he's talking about. Yeah. You know? Buzzwords that they were waiting for just slipped Buzzword. in there. Just slipped in there. I know. Whoa. The prior to 1914 years were as different from today's world as to as day is from night. Parents then, even as now, taught their children nothing about sex. They themselves knew nothing. Their parents never had taught them. Besides, it would have been too embarrassing. The commonly accepted dictum was keep our children innocent enough through ignorance until marriage. Then instinct will teach them. Let's remember that bit about instinct. Shut yeah. the fuck up. 
Now I am convinced that he wrote this shit on purpose. Dictum. Yeah. Oh. Fucking dictum. But Who I don't know if dick. Fuck, he uses dictum. I, well, this was a long time ago that he wrote it. And also, I don't know if Dick was quite as, um, like, used the way we use it now. It was just a short name for Richard over there, you know. I'm going to check. <laughs> I'm going to check this. Um, when but did I, Dick start to mean? Yeah, I'm it. checking the etymology of Dick. Wow. Okay, great. Me. You go ahead and do that. I'm going to keep reading. Okay. But instinct did not teach them. Humans, unlike animals, do not come equipped with instinct. Bullshit. Really? Blindly, with a smattering of gutter-acquired misknowledge. <laughs> gutter rat. Gutter rat. Okay. The newly married blundered their way into disillusionments, shattered dreams, bitter resentments, and frustrations. And too often the divorce courts, although divorces were still a rarity. I mean... Lube could have helped people a lot, I suppose. Avoided all those uh, disillusionments, as he's calling it. But Joel, it. didn't you say that even the ancient Egyptians had lube? Yeah, it was honey. Was it honey? Oh, God, that seems like a no, bad idea. No, no, Honey served as something <laughs> for them. That was like their suntan. Or like, I know they used honey for something. Yeah, think, I think it was <laughs> the Egyptians had lube. Yeah, yeah probably yeah, not they used honey, something. Though. Uh, dick started to be used in 1891. Okay. For dick. Yeah, for 1891? All right. It was so he possibly British it. Army slang. Okay. So. True. A very large percentage of girls were kept pure. The oh. girl up to 1914 who lost her virginity unmarried had also lost her honor. Of course, a double standard had developed. Every man wanted a virgin for a wife, but a majority were less careful about male virtue. Hmm. Yet the girl who had gone the limit was damaged goods. Chewed, Chewed gum. gum. <laughs> Wait, okay. I thought men oh, couldn't have virtue. Right? I thought it was only valor. The word virtue means it has something to do with a man. I forget what vir vir virile. Yeah, virile and virtue oh. are related. Yep. Oh, We're talking sense. about testing and testes. Yeah, virile yeah. and virtue. Those under 30 today, which none of us are, know little about prevailing attitudes and sexual behavior prior to the two world wars. Contrary wise, if a girl who died at age 22 prior to 1917 were resurrected and suddenly back to life today, this is weird, she would be appalled, horrified at the prevailing <laughs> attitude and behavior of 22-year-old girls today. So he's trying to get girls to be catty bitches to each other, even imagining one that, like, is dead. It's cool. Just what are the generally unrealized facts in capital? What was the real origin of the then traditional Christian morality? And Ooh, conversely, so many ways. Go ahead. Okay. And conversely, what triggered the moral revolution, the so called new morality? How did today's moderns come to accept present attitudes and behavior patterns? I don't know. Things just change, dude. Jeez. What has finally, after thousands of years of the sex is shameful repression plunge the world into prevalent sexual freedoms and what i yes. see what he's saying i actually can see what he's saying now he's saying okay. that um we were so uptight about sex that it's only natural for us to come to that point where uh we're sex crazy um, I, I see somewhat sense in that, but I don't think it's completely accurate. Um, but the, yeah. uh, but I, but I do actually see it. Restriction is in general, um, going to cause us to, to go more crazy with stuff yeah. when that restriction is lifted, right? Like things you have I'm to wait till you're 18 of that. for. Yeah. And so, I mean, I, as a parent, I fully advocate instead for a model of, um, information build up your child's confidence and um, understanding of their own autonomy and build up their understanding of the consequences of sexual activity, psychological, physical, all of those things. Like, I don't know, raise smart humans, 
instead of obedient ones, for fuck's sake. I've been doing a lot of research on the scandals of Herbert W. Armstrong. There were a couple different sources that came out and said Armstrong used to call his followers dumb sheep. This would have been in his later years when he started really making a lot of money. And you know what happens to televangelists when they have more money than they know what to fucking do with. They have vaginas thrown in their face from every which way. They have private jets. Even Armstrong had a, a champagne bucket made of pure silver that he spent $8,000 on. Well, yeah. we had holes in our carpet to the subfloor. Mm -hmm. And we because were our parents gave that money to him. Yeah. Okay. Check. Noted. And our parents are broke as fuck right now, too. And all they've ever done is give money to his organization. I wonder how they're faring with the RCG nonsense, but that's... Yeah. Well, we will unpack it, Joel. We have a month left. Month of what? Oh. the uh, We have a month left. The countdown. A countdown to what? Explain. To fifteenth, uh, to to the fifteenth of of Aviv, the first month of the Hebrew calendar, yeah, around Passover time. That's when he says that's they're they're all going to be lifted away. You're saying David C. Pack said that? Uh huh. Oh. Another and Joel's a little concerned. Prediction. Well, Joel's a little concerned that he's like more serious this time than he has been other times. Like he might the cause them. Actual well, stuff. this is uh, the reason why I say that is because he's saying sell everything. And did he necessarily say sell everything before? He's saying his members to sell everything? Sell everything. Give him every estate. Give him everything. Sell everything is literally what he's saying. We it sounds have... like Brother Stair of the Overcomer, Overcomer Ministry in Walterboro, South Carolina. Our parents followed him, too. Okay, so they so he at one point said to sell. Okay, so your parents will probably be fine then. Okay, just I'm just when I hear shit like that, it it, it makes me very uncomfortable. Yeah, but it's a little Jones to towny. And what after all is the plain truth? What after all are the true values? I think true value is a hardware store, but that's neither here nor there. Was the pre World War concept better for humanity? Is the present new morality really advancement, really better for those who are swept along with it? People who lived prior to the 20th century would be aghast if they could see life as it is today. Up until World War I, people believed in marriage and family life. My own family was typical. I had never known of a divorce or a broken home and family in any of my relatives or ancestors. Marriage was until death do us part. Any other status or lifestyle would have been strange and shocking. But what brought this drastic change? I call fucking bullshit on that last <laughs> paragraph area. Yep. Agree. Oh, yeah. Right. Bullshit. I love how he had the perfect life. So obviously everybody else had it wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Had he been born a young black boy in Africa? Would he think differently than he does now? Or in <laughs> Alabama? So well, Patty, you just brought us to climax. We are now at chapter one. It, I, I think I hope it was as enjoyable to you as it was for me. Armstrong said to look them directly into the eyes very close. And now, Israel, listen carefully to these decrees and regulations that I am about to give you, teach you, obey them so that you may live. So you may enter and occupy the land that the Lord your God, the God of your ancestors, is giving you. Do not add to or subtract from these commands that I am giving you. Just obey the commands of the Lord your God that I am giving you. Eventually a new king came to power in Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph or what he had done. He said to his people, look, the people of Israel now outnumber us and are stronger than we are. We must make a plan to keep them from growing even more. If we don't, and if war breaks out, they will join our enemies and fight against us. Then they will escape from the country. So the Egyptians made the Israelites their slaves. 
They appointed brutal slave drivers over them, hoping to wear them down with crushing labor. They forced them to build the cities of Pithom and Ramses as supply centers for the king. But the more, I, I hope you're enjoying this as much as I am, but the more of Egyptians. <laughs> I love how, by the way, how many sexual innuendos the fucking Bible has. Everything in modern society has been, like, sanitized. You know, it's not like people weren't sexual before we got to the modern time. Like, they were way exactly. more sexual and open about it. Like, people didn't have doors with locks. Like, <laughs> By the way, I would just like to throw out this fun little nugget. The world's oldest animal. It's a tortoise. He still fucks. Have you seen, have you seen ostriches fucking? No. It's a dance. It's like the male is on top of the woman going like, uh, the male is on top of the going like this. And like the female is just sitting there like this. That's another point that Armstrong brings up in his book is that somehow animals don't enjoy sex. I would beg to differ. Have you seen some of these videos out here of like turtles they... fucking and shit? The so there's a lot of scientific research that I'm glad you brought that up because that particular subject actually interested me when I was deconstructing. They do enjoy, as far as we can tell. Um, there is, uh, but some enjoy more than others. Like dolphins enjoy it a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, but the uh, but the thing is, though, not every animal does enjoy it. Uh, there's little evidence to show that, like for example, that rabbits really enjoy it. It's just like part of like their their biological like driven nature to get that done. Um, well, remember, so they, really they take birds. a shit, turn around, and eat it. So yes. Like but they don't chew the cud. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <they don't. laughs> um, Thanks, everybody, for joining us for this first episode of Unpack It, reading Herbert W. Armstrong's The Missing Dimension in Sex. Don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, and go find Mr. Difficult on TikTok and YouTube.